Well, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. I'm Brenda Bauer, and I'm the Dementia Awareness Outreach Specialist for the Wisconsin Board for People Development with Disabilities. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gunlock, and I am a Communication Specialist with the Wisconsin Board for People Development with Disabilities. So we appreciate all of you coming out. It's really nice to connect directly with families. Um, we do a variety of presentations throughout the year, primarily this presentation. Um, it's a topic about dementia, obviously specific about dementia and IDD. But it's nice to be able to connect one-on-one -on -one with people because we don't always get to do that um, when you have bigger audiences and conferences and things like that. So um, some of you had questions of our backgrounds and things like that. Jeremy and I are actually on a three-year project um, from the ADI SSS grant. And this project is called Mind and, Mem <coughs> Mind and Memory Matters. To the clicker. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, we wanted something that, that would stick in people's minds, and the, the alliteration helps a lot. So it's kind of where that comes from. Also, the ADI SSS grant stands for the Alzheimer's D Disease Initiative Specialized Supported Services Grant. So that's, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's a well, you'll see it on the next screen. <laughs> the last one in your packets have a um, handout of all of our presentation. So there's room there to take notes if you'd like, but you don't not necessarily need to. The information's right there. So again, that's um, the grant, the ADI SSS grant. These are the partners that we also have on this grant. So they're doing specific work, not necessarily related to dementia and IDD. Um, for example, the Alzheimer's Association, that Greater Wisconsin chapter, chapter, they're focused on the tribal units and the music and memory program. So that's what she's primarily doing for her part of the grant. So we each have different portions of the grant, um, but again, there are partners. And some of them are actually on our advisory board as well. So they are helping us with this particular project. Um, but as it says, there's a partnership between the board, Wisconsin Board for People with Developmental Disabilities and DHS. And um, we're really here to inform families and care providers and let them know about the prevalence of Alzheimer's dementia and those um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So Jeremy and I are out there providing outreach and training, um, talking about the screen that's available for families they can use. Um, and we also want to see professionals, and like I said, other caregivers using this screening as well. And obviously the overall outcome of this project is to help increase the quality of life um, for those with dementia and, and also helping out the caregivers and providing some support to those caregivers. Uh, we were trained by the National Task Group, and they were actually formed um, thanks to the 2011 NAPA Act, so the National Alzheimer's um, I don't know, I was going to mix up Project Act. It's very simple. For some reason, I always want to get them mixed up. And like I said, our advisory board, we have over 15 people on it. Um, we do have a member of um, GUAR on there. We have a member from the Special Olympics, um, the Down Syndrome Association of Wisconsin, the Wiseman Center, um, the Autism Society of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alzheimer's <coughs> Institute. So we have a variety of people on our advisory board that kind of help us along um, with this project. Uh, yeah, and so uh, before we get going, like Brenda said, we're on a three-year grant, and so um, our advisory board, we, we wanted to have a, a very inclusive um, board with, with people representing agencies all across the state and, and from different aspects so that we could, you know, kind of see where, where are the gaps in, in uh, early detection for Alzheimer's or, or just general dementia in people with IDD, and how does that affect long-term care? Um, and I'm sure as all of you know, the, the long-term care system is kind of up in the air right now. We, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we had the, the 2.0 kind of get dropped this summer, and so we're waiting to see uh, how that all rolls around. Um, another thing before we get started, so this, this presentation, there's a lot of information in these slides, and we only have about an hour with you tonight, and so we didn't want to, to cut anything out of here. Um, some of the stuff we'll, we'll go through a little bit faster, but we wanted you to have the, the slides so that you could go home and, and kind of pick through it. Uh, also, our contact information is in there and our website is in there so that if you leave here tonight and you're like, oh yeah, I, I feel like I learned a lot, and then you're thinking, oh, I still have some questions, feel free to give us a, a call or an email. Um, we're, we're very happy to talk outside of the, the presentation. So. Um, all right, healthy aging and IDD. Uh, there's there's going to be a lot of it's it's kind of acronym world when you get into the the state and um, you know the medical world and all this. So if there's any 
confusion on, on what a certain acronym is, we'll, we'll try to uh, you know explain those, but sometimes, as we said with the ADI SSS grant, that's, it, it kind of gets us tongue twisted. Um, so, factors impacting healthy aging. What is aging? Aging happens to, to all of us from, from the moment we're, we're conceived and born up until the moment we die. Um, it affects everyone as an individual, so for, uh, that's why some people will, will smoke their entire life and never have lung cancer, and some people who, who don't smoke will have lung cancer. Um, so uh, uh, we know that there are long-term consequences for um, how, how we're raised at, at a very early age. So, so some early trauma or some things like post-polio syndrome can affect you later on in life, even though it's something that happened at a very young age. Uh, pro prolonged use of medication, um, especially for this audience, uh, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities we know have, have a much higher occurrence of, of being on multiple medications for a lot longer time than, than the general population. Um, some factors in impacting healthy aging for individuals with IDD, uh, problems accessing health <coughs> services. So not only uh, finding a doctor who has, has worked with someone with an intellectual or developmental disability, but also transportation for a lot of folks. Um, we come from Madison and so we go around and do these presentations and, and people always say, well, you're spoiled, you're from Madison. Um, you know, and, and a lot of these more rural areas don't have transportation that's easy to get to. Um, and when it is, there, there's always a, a process. So you have to um, make an appointment and then say you lose that, that, that ride and you have to remake your, your doctor's appointment, which can set you back months and months and months. And so, so finding a doctor who, who you know, will, will know you for a long time and then being able to, to get to that doctor. Uh, Lack of exercise, poor nutrition, and bad eating habits, these are all things that can affect um, healthy aging. So um, someone who uh, do doesn't eat healthy, obviously that's going to affect your body elsewhere. Um, also things like genetics, um, your, your, your lifestyle, so drinking, smoking, um, those types of things. Soda, um, that's another one. Uh, everybody loves soda, but I... Uh, uh, on the side, work with kids with transition. We do this this um, activity with with sugar and soda, and it's real bad. So that's just my plug on on health. But uh, <laughs> real glad you picked up water for today. Um, <coughs> so yeah, once again, going back to uh, health disparities. So not only uh, finding a doctor who who knows you and and knows how to work with someone with an intellectual developmental disability, but healthcare provider turnover. So um, having having new new support staff, job coaches. Um, who who are some other people that you you see that there's turnover in your lives? Anybody? As far as support staff. Social services. Social services. Yep. <coughs> so there's 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 less of a, a continuity of of services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There's there's lots of gaps in in their medical history a lot of times. And that can cause problems, especially when you're looking at, um, you know, a, a lifestyle approach to aging. Diagnostic overshadowing. So, um, one of the things with with this, we'll get into it in a little bit, but um, uh, dementia affects people with IDD about the same as the general population, with uh, the exception of a couple subgroups. So, people with Down syndrome um, are are at a much higher risk for Alzheimer's. And so we, we see diagnostic overshadowing going both ways. Um, someone may go in for a, a memory screen and they, you know, it's, it's an adult child of, you know, maybe one of yours with Down syndrome who's, who's 35 or 40 and maybe that doctor has heard the stats on Down syndrome and Alzheimer's and so they'll immediately think, well, this, is, this person is, is suffering from dementia, probably some form of Alzheimer's. They'll jump right to it rather than going through what's called the differential diagnosis. Um, the, other, the other way we see that is, is doctors may, may just attribute the, these um, decline in, in cognitive function to uh, the pre-existing disability. So it's, um, you know, this person isn't suffering from, from dementia or a loss of cognitive function. They're 
um, just aging with, with a disability, and that's normal. And so we, uh, we're here to kind of find that middle ground, especially in, in doctor's appointments. Uh, this, this is a great um, just, just image, you know. Pictures are worth a thousand words, even though there's some words on here. Um, but it, this is real good to, to go through later um, and just double check that, that you're, um, you know, knowledgeable on this because we, uh, doctors going through med school, there, there is no required class or, or training for um, interacting with people with disabilities. And so a lot of people that, that I've spoken to, um, that are physicians or nurses, they'll say that they had one not a like semester class, but one class out of a semester long class, so like possibly an hour where they talk about individuals with disabilities. And so, um, you know, someone who's, who's going through med school, coming out of it, they may have never been in a room and had to, to go through that, that, you know, even just a normal doctor's appointment with someone with a, a developmental disability. Yeah? I know we saw, um, Melanie went the other night, uh, Thursday night, there's a a group that comes in to help. It was not only the Marquette High School, but they had some college students from the medical college helping doctors that were coming in. And that was cool. There, there are some cool programs around the state. Um, Special Olympics, the, the Healthy Athletes. Um, I'm sure you guys are all somewhat um, <coughs> informed on the Healthy Athletes, but a lot of times the people who run those different sections of that, so the Healthy Eyes, um, Oh man, there's dental. the dental. They're they're all um, like first year dental students or first year optometry students. So they they're getting that that experience of um, you know working with someone with a disability, but also just normal experience of going through procedures and, and things. And so um, I, I I was new to the the healthy athletes part of Special Olympics, and it's wonderful since I I've, I've learned about it. That's how we got involved with Special Olympics was we saw um, Missy, who's one of the, the managers for that, give a presentation and they were just going over stats on, uh, you know, the amount of free eyeglasses, like glasses that they give out, the amount of, um, uh, they'll, they'll refer people to, to dentists who specialize in, in working with people with IDD. Um, I know NPR just put out an article on Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin, I want to say yesterday, about how, how great they are at, at you know, working with, with everybody, not just the, the general population. Um, so dementia and IDD. So again, this is gonna talk quite a bit about dementia. So for some of you, <coughs> just a raise of hands, how many of you had some training or some knowledge of dementia symptoms? And Okay, so again, I'll quickly kind of go through this section because um, there's some review here. Our audience is never really sure how much people have um, knowledge about these topics. Um, we look at the four most important facts about dementia, the loss of cognitive thought, the term dementia describing as a group of symptoms, dementia itself is not the name of a disease, um, and the conditions referred to as dementia might be caused by many things, so keeping in mind that some of these are treatable. I, like, I think a lot of us um, are familiar with the UTI and what UTIs, the symptoms that bring that on. Um, so making sure that we're checking um, those types of things first and ruling them out. And keeping in mind that dementia is not part of a um, normal aging. <coughs> People with Down syndrome are roughly five times at the risk of um, having gen uh, dementia versus the general population. So that's really important statistic to keep in mind, and that's a lot of reason, you know, that's the main reason why we are focused on the topic in this project. I think this chart is very helpful. It compares um, a person with intellectual developmental disability, their prevalence of dementia versus someone with Down syndrome. Um, so the IDD population is really close to the general public as far as a risk goes for dementia. If you look at age 40, 22% of of people with Down syndrome are at risk of dementia. If you look at the age of 60, look at the difference. 60% now, or excuse me, 56% are now at risk. Anyone, can someone tell me the four top types of dementia? Hold on, I'm gonna go back so you can't look up. All right, all right, now, now. The answers are right in your handouts too. <laughs> Anyone? Okay. All right, all right. 
we're, we're, we're very okay with the, the back and forth. Interaction, we yeah. Have, it's, it's been interesting. Yeah, exactly. We were stuck in the car together all day. <laughs> so. This is a great um, slide to kind of um, get in perspective. The umbrella of the term dementia, the symptoms that come with it, but specifically the four um, key types of dementia. So your vascular dementia, some of us were talking about that earlier, your Parkinson's, your frontal temporal uh, lobe dementia, um, the Lewy body, and then your Alzheimer's disease. Um, one thing to note, uh, we just had training again through the National Task Group. They came into uh, Wisconsin for us, so we have more people trained, like Jeremy and I. And um, she really went into specifics about the difference between Lewy body and Parkinson's. And what I thought was interesting is um, when a person is diagnosed with Parkinson's, they're often the first symptoms are a change in movement versus a change in behavior. When there's a diagnosis of Lewy body, it's quite the opposite. You actually find the behavior changes first over the movement. Um, but how many, how many of you are familiar with these four types? Just one, really. Um, and then, uh, so it's, it's, it's a little small in, in your handouts, but if, if you look at this, um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common um, for, for not just people with intellectual dis developmental disabilities. This is for, for everybody and anybody. Um, and so a lot of these, you know, you look at Parkinson's and frontal temporal dementia, it's, you know, 5% a piece. And then with vascular, it gets up there to be about 20%. Uh, and dementia with Lewy body is 15%, <coughs> Alzheimer's is 50 to 70% of cases of dementia. The, the, the range on Alzheimer's is, is a lot larger than the other ones because Alzheimer's is, it's hard to get a, a confirmed diagnosis right now where, where our, our technology is at um, until someone has, has passed on. So, um, you know, they, they go through the, the post-mortem uh, process with, with an autopsy and that's when they can go in and see that the, the brain has shrunk and um, sorry I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so it's really important to note that there are different characteristics between the different types of dementia. Um, one of the things I think family get caught up especially if um, there may be some denial going on in families, it wasn't our own family, is um, they start recognizing some bad behavior. So I have a mother who has dementia and she was living with my brother and she started to fall. She started with a cane and she was using a walker. We thought that was better. And my, I'd come over and my brother would say, well, she only falls when you're here. And he, he was insistent that she was doing it for attention. And I kept saying, I think there's something more going on here. And um, it did, I mean, it took some time for me in doctor's visits and reviewing CAT scans and things like that. She had other symptoms coming on. Um, including incontinence and things like that. And we had her neurosurgeon look at all her scans the past five years and sure enough, her brain was shrinking and they finally did the diagnosis of dementia. But for some family members, that's difficult to understand. It's difficult to accept. And um, my brother was one of them. You know, he just kept thinking she's doing these things intentionally. And really the falls were, you know, one of our key signs that something, something's going on, so. Uh, we, we're, we're, oh, here we go. we're really pushing um, the, the different types because it's, it's good as you go through this to, to know the different types because they, they present in different ways and a lot of the different types of, of untreatable dementias are, um, you know, they kind of follow a, a path. Like we said earlier, um, you know, pe people age individually and, and different conditions affect people as individuals. Um, but there, there are certain things that, that, you know, Alzheimer's, it, you know, no matter who it is, there's going to be some sort of similar progression of the disease. And so with some of these symptoms, like with Lewy bodies, it's, it's very common for people to have very vivid visual hallucinations. And so knowing, knowing that can help you kind of steer that, that diagnosis, saying, well, you know, yeah, yeah. I have a question about that, because, okay, so my son, along with his um, developmental disabilities, he is schizophrenic. So he already has auditory and visual hallucinations. So how would you ascertain the difference? That's, well, that's a question. Um, so that's, that's a hard one just because there, there, there isn't a whole lot known about schizophrenia. Um, we know that it's, um, oh, schizophrenia comes, from, it's, uh, is it Latin or Greek? 
assuming it's Latin, but it, it's, it, it, it means shattered self. Mm -hmm. And so they know that there's, there's some sort of, of um, you know, a, a person's psyche is kind of split. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, there, there isn't a lot, you know, that they, as far as I'm aware of, um, know like what, what the cause is. They know kind of when, when it'll come out by. But just just keeping an eye on the, the visual hallucinations, um, is is are the, are they pretty consistent in how they're they're happening? Well, or? He's, he's pretty much stable now. I mean, he wasn't always, but I'm a big advocate for him, and uh, pushed to get him on the medication that I wanted him on instead of the thirty that the doctor wanted him on. Um, so he's stable, but he still gets, you know. Somebody snuck in the bedroom last night. I saw him come in the basement and go again. You know, he still gets that kind of thing every now and again. So, um, but he's not in his 40s yet. He's still, you know, he just turned 30. So, I, I would say look at some of the other symptoms. Um, a lot of these, so um, it, it'll be an onset of new hallucinations. So, being that he already, you know, has, has another diagnosis that, you know, causes him to have hallucinations. I would I would go through and, and see if there are other symptoms that, that he's showing, and then um, you know talk to your talk to your doctor on you know hey is this normal for for schizophrenia or what's what are the differences here? And then coming back and reviewing those medications again. I know oh, even with my mom and, and things that she had, because um, hers initially was an aneurysm many years ago, and we went through many trials of medication <coughs> with the different symptoms that she had that were even prior to any symptoms of dementia. And um, it sounds like you've already been through some of those mm -hmm. medication trials. But like Jeremy said, then when there's new hallucinations, you know, dementia comes on gradually. It's not something that's um, immediate. So, you know, looking for things that have come on gradually besides those type of hallucinations. We do have an answer coming up on how to track some of those changes okay. over time. Um, Yeah, we have to get moving. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Alzheimer's, we know, is the sixth leading cause of death in America. It kills more than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined, which is a pretty shocking, which is why, you know, this is suddenly becoming more on the top of minds of people. Um, again, it's generalized brain atrophy, the amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are part of what happens in the brain. And again, this happens with the general public. It's no different than a person with IDD or Down syndrome as well. Um, so again, thinking about this, <coughs>